Okay, so good morning and happy Friday. All right, so let's remind ourselves uh, how a double slit uh, interference experiment is set up. First of all, uh, what is the condition for the light source? It has to be monochromatic, meaning it has a single wavelength, right? And furthermore, the, uh, the light source has to be coherent. So that's a setup where we pass um, a light ray from a monochromatic uh, light source through the double slit, where the distance between the two slits is given by D. Some distance L away, that's where our screen is located. On the screen, you will be able to uh, observe the interference pattern. And let's define, uh, say, zero. As our reference point, this is uh, at the center of the axis that goes through um, the center between the two slits. So, uh, say some distance above the central axis, let's call this distance y. So, correspond to this distance, we have an angle theta, right? So, for, for um, sorry, so there's a one, one to one correspondence between theta and y. Everybody would agree with this? All right, so as we already argued last time, if the screen is very, very far away, uh, meaning if L is much bigger compared to the distance between the two slits, then those three lines we draw are almost parallel. Right, they can be approximated as parallel. Agreed. All right. So making use of this fact, we know this angle is 90 degrees. This is R1, which is a path uh, for the light wave coming out of the first slit. And similarly, this distance is R2, and uh, this middle line, let's call it L, which is nothing but the distance between the two states and the screen. So far, so good? Yep. All right. And this angle, let's call it theta. And I hope you already convinced yourself at home that if this angle is theta, then this angle must be theta. So to find out, what type of pattern you have at this particular location? What is the relevant quantity? There will be the path difference between R2 and R1, which what we called delta last time, right? All right, so delta is this distance is R2 minus R1, which we can express in terms of the uh, distance between the two slits and this angle theta. And what is the expression? D sine theta.
right, so what is the condition that uh, Delta has to satisfy in order to have a bright spot, meaning constructive interference? The path difference must be integral multiple of a wavelength, right? It's either zero or lambda or two lambda or three lambda in order to have constructive interference. So for constructive interference, at this point, let's call it P, the path difference, delta, must be equal to integral multiple over four wavelength. And there I code this corresponding theta as theta bright because you expect to, act, uh, to observe a bright spot at point P, right? Because it's constructive interference. Where M here, assume integer value, from zero, one, two, et cetera. So this parameter M is called the order. So on the question you are given, you may be asked, what is the location of uh, order one bright spot that will correspond to this number M, all right? So what is the location that corresponds to theta being zero? There will be the central point, right? So at the location that corresponds to the central bright spot. Which is a zeros order maximal with corresponding m being zero. Where on either side of this uh, central bright fringe, uh, once you get to um, distance correspond to m being plus or minus one, once again you get a bright fringe. So those are your older one bright fringes, right? This first older. Maximum. All right, so that relation tells you what the angle theta is for a particular location. How about the corresponding uh, distance y away from the central axis? Can you express y in terms of the angle theta? Yes, and what is the relation? L sine theta. L sine theta. So the location for the bright fringes, y bright, is L, which is the distance between the double slits and the screen, times sine of uh, theta. Which is L times M lambda over D.
Any questions about this? All right, so this, is, uh, this refers to locations for the bright fringes. How about dark fringes? Those will correspond to destructive interference. For those location, uh, the path length difference delta, which once again is given by d times sine of the corresponding angle, will satisfy a different uh, condition. And what is the condition? Integer plus half wavelength. Good. So once we get theta through this uh, relation, we can write down the expression for the location y, right? So y dark, meaning the uh, distance away from the central axis, is once again given by L sine theta. Yes? Um, are we to be little L? Uh, I am interchanging little l and big L. Yes. <coughs> and it doesn't really matter, because I should tell you, right here I'm making use of the small angle approximation, meaning I assume that angle theta is small. So, so I'll just keep big L, yeah? Is that clear? You, you agree with this, sta this statement? Good. All right, so here, this is L sine theta dark, which is L lambda over D, some integer plus one half. And once again, This formula holds for a small value of theta, where for small theta, we can make use of the small angle approximation, where theta in radians is roughly tangent theta which can be approximated as sine theta. <laughs> so what this is telling us is that all this formula I, uh, we wrote down only uh, hold for the pattern which are closer to the central axis, right? Because if I go away from central, uh, meaning if say I'm counting the 20th bright fringes, that would be very far, I mean, that would be uh, corresponding to large angle theta. Can everybody see this? Yeah, so this only holds, uh, but they hold for, uh, to a very good approximation for fringes which are not too far away from the center. observe on the screen would be the following. Suppose this is center. We already argued that it has to be bright spot, right? Because right at the center point, R1 and R2 are equal. And therefore, uh, these two waves interfere constructively. What would be the location for the first order maximal on either side of the center? Mm. 
You have the inside on the board. It will be proportional to L. Which formula should I use to find out the location of the first order maxima bright spot? That one, right? And what value of M should I put in? One, because I'm asking the first order maxima. So what is this distance? L lambda over D, very good. So that will be the location of the first maximum from the center. And similarly, the same distance below the center, you get the first order maximum, right? All right, so what, how about the distance between the first minima uh, above the center? Which formula should I use? Y dark. But what value of M should I put in? Zero, right? So the first uh, minima that I encounter would be at the location which is lambda L, sorry, uh, yes, lambda L over 2D. And similarly, below the center, at distance lambda L over 2D, you get the first dark spot. Then I can also ask you, what is the distance between the first maximal uh, above the center from the first uh, dark spot below the center. You just add them up, right? That will refers to this distance, which is uh, 3 lambda L over 2D. So far, so good? All right, and then of course, All the bright spots are adjacent uh, by the same distance. So right here, at distance of 2L lambda over D away from center, you get a second uh, maxima, etc. Any questions about this before I move on? All right. So another place where you uh, observe the interference uh, phenomena is uh, on the soap bubble. You have seen this very colorful uh, surface of the soap bubble. And these various colors uh, are due to the, are result of the interference 
of light waves uh, that get reflected from two surfaces of the film. Suppose here I have a uh, some medium and light go from N1, medium N1, into medium N2 and back to N1. So you can think about this is the uh, surface of a soap bubble with certain uh, thickness uh, given by T here. So the thickness of the film is T, all right? So without proving, I'm just going to tell you the result where for like go from a medium with um, index of refraction N1 into a medium um, of index of refraction N2, this reflected ray at the surface um, would have a phase change of 180 degrees if N1 is smaller than N2. Converse, re reversely, if N1 is greater than N2, then there's no phase change. All right, so let's take that fact and see what happened when the light get reflected twice at these two surfaces. So at this interface, there would be some light ray get reflected. And suppose the first medium is air and the second medium is water, then there would be a 180 degrees phase change for this reflected ray, right? Because N1 is smaller than N2. But there's something else happened at this interface. And what is it? Refraction. Refraction. So some of the light will get into the second medium Right? Along. And this angle, of course, is determined by Snell's law, which you already learned. Where at the second surface, once again, the light could get reflected. Yes? And then there's refraction happening. So let's call this pass number two. So the light ray coming out of uh, through this path, which I indicated as one, and, uh, and those that come out uh, through this path that I indicated by two, they will interfere. And the pattern of this interference would depend upon the phase differences, uh, the, the phase difference between these two paths. Agree? All right, so my question to you is, for this path number two, is there any phase change of 180 degrees because of the reflection? No, right? Because at this surface, you go from a larger index of refraction medium into a smaller one. And according to that rule, there's no phase change. Correct? But what else do I have to take into account? Are these two light rays travel the same distance? No, 
And what's the uh, difference in, in the distance? It would be twice, roughly twice the thickness of the thin film. Assuming that these two light rays are almost uh, perpendicular to the surface of the film. Right, so let me write that down. So once again, uh, ray number two travels an extra distance of uh, twice the thickness of the film, assuming that uh, the light rays are nearly perpendicular to the surface. This is clear? All right. So how do you get constructive interference in this case? Uh, between ray number one and ray number two. Remember ray number one has this extra 800, uh, sorry, 180 degrees phase change, or equivalently you can say uh, there's a, all right, so yeah, so that's, that's point number one. And in order to offset this uh, 180 degrees phase change, uh, 2T must be, half the wavelength, right? All right, so if 2T, twice of the thickness, which is this extra distance that ray two travels, is equal to half the wavelength, then ray number one, and ray number two will be in phase. And therefore, you get constructive interference. Is this clear? So generally, to get constructive interference, the condition on the thickness of the film is that it must, twice the thickness of the film must be equal to an integer plus one half of the wavelength. And here the wavelength is wavelength in the medium. All right, any questions about this? Is it clear why there's an extra one half here? Because you want to offset that 180 degrees uh, from ray number one. All right, so this is for the case when N N1 is smaller than N2 meaning the light started from a medium with smaller index of refraction into the uh, medium with larger index of refraction. But suppose you have a situation
where you have three different medium. All right, so the first interface is between medium uh, that has index of refraction N1 and the medium uh, that has index of refraction N2, where the second interface is an interface between um, medium that has index of refraction N2 and that with index of refraction N3. And suppose uh, N1 is smaller than N2, which is smaller than N3. Is it clear what the setup is? Right, so, all right, so is this light ray, light ray number one, get that extra uh, 180 degrees phase change due to reflection? Uh, let's see whether, no, sorry, I actually wanted reverse. Sorry, I, I want the reverse. I want N1 to be greater than N2, which is greater than N3. All right, so in that case, is there 180 degrees phase change? No, very good. How about this interface? Remember N2, ah. I actually want to consider this, sorry. At this interface, again, no, because N2 is greater than N3, right? All right, so what would be the condition then uh, in order to get constructive interference? In this case, which is different than the previous case, here, uh, twice of the thickness must be equal to integral multiple of a wavelength. Everybody agree with this? So let me just write it down. Um, so here, to get constructive interference, we need Two n t equals to uh, integral multiple of a wavelength. In other words, twice of the thickness t is equal to integral multiple of the wavelength inside that medium number two. that will give me a phase change of zero or um, two pi or 360 degrees, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, I get constructive interference. Can everybody see that? So what I did there is a bit uh, more sophisticated, meaning I rewrite lambda N2 as lambda, which is a wavelength in a vacuum divided by uh, the index of refraction in medium number two. And similarly, you know how to write down the condition for destructive interference, right? Instead of an integer, you would have a integer plus one half. So for a destructive case, the condition is that twice and two times the thickness equals to integer plus one half times the wavelength in vacuum. All right, so the very last, any questions? It's clear. All right, so the very last topic, uh, concerns a modern day uh, application of the light interference, and that's a so-called Michelson uh, interferometer. Which has the following setup.
So here you have a uh, light source. which reach uh, the so-called beam splitter. So half of the light get uh, changed. I mean, so, so basically the light ray gets split into two. One get reflected along this path, all right? And the other half would just continue along that direction. All right, so for the light ray that get uh, split at this point, that go along this direction, uh, some distance away, there's a mirror, so the light ray get bounced back along the same path. And similarly, uh, for the other half, that continues uh, going on along this direction, at some distance L2 away, there's another mirror, second mirror, so this light ray once again get bounced back, right? And once these two light beams uh, get back to this point, they get recombined. So this is some telescope where you can observe the pattern of this recombined uh, light rays. Is it clear what the setup is? Yeah? So let's call this distance from the beam splitter and the first mirror as L1, and the uh, distance between the beam splitter and the second mirror, M2, as L2. So if these two distances, L1 and L2, are exactly the same, then what do you expect when both beams uh, get back to the same point? Should they uh, interfere constructively or destructively? Constructively, right? Because the paths are the, the same. between uh, L1 and L2 that is needed in order to get a destructive interference. One half of the wavelength. So, uh, all right, so let, let me rephrase my question differently. How much does M2 has to move? Is it one half of the wavelength? Quarter, right? Because remember the light go back and forth twice. Oh, okay. So, so in order to have destructive interference, the difference between the these two distances has to be. Um, quarter of a wavelength. Everybody agree with this statement? Right, because remember the light goes, I mean, for beam number one, it goes the distance of a 2L1, where for beam number two, the distance is twice L2. So to get a destructive interference, you need uh, the difference to be quarter of a wavelength. So making use of this uh, instrument, uh, actually there is an ongoing experiment called LIGO, which is going to detect gravi gravitational wave. Have you heard about this? So, how, so Einstein's theory predicts the existence of gravity wave. Basically the way you think about it is that if there's gravity wave, that's like the ripple of space. And if there's such ripple of space, 
uh, even though we constructed uh, this uh, interferometer at two like equal distances, like two, two equal arms, this ripple of space was stretched um, these two distances uh, by different amount. Does that sort of make sense? <laughs> so we will actually see some uh, really nice video about that. Um, but how does this gravity wave get produced? So the current theory that we know of uh, that may produce gravity wave could be the collision of black hole, for example. Uh, so this LIGO experiment, um, which will actually be in operation next year, 2014, um, you can detect, say, one black hole collision per year. So this is a very, very rare event. And in order to uh, be able to detect uh, this ripple of space, uh, this uh, instrument needs to be very, very sensitive, right? And it actually is sensitive down to one part in 10 to the 80 meters 